Good morning and welcome to ACC Online, a place where we hope that you can connect or reconnect to God. If this is your first time joining us, we would love to be able to connect with you throughout this week. So you can do that simply by texting the word CONNECT to 210-585-4006 and someone from our staff will reach out to you throughout the rest of the week. And we hope you have your coffee ready. If you're super blessed and you have a taco, that's amazing. Uh, We hope you have a Bible, maybe something to jot down the things that God is going to show you today. We're so excited to move into a time of worship with our worship pastor, Caleb Sines, as we worship our God who does great things. Well, good morning, ACC. We're excited to worship with you in song again this week. You know, last week in our worship time together, we pondered the question, Why do we sing? What does scripture say about that? And we looked at three things. Scripture tells us to sing to rejoice because it's a joyful thing to remember who God is. And that leads us to the second reason. We sing because we recount the great works of our God, both as a reminder to us and a testimony to the world. And finally, we sing as we do all these things to recalibrate, to bring ourselves back to the heart of God. Psalm 149, like many Psalms, tells us to sing for these reasons, to sing a new song. It also tells us that this is ultimately not just for our joy, but to the joy of the Lord. It brings him joy for us to sing. But it also adds this in Psalm 149.5, maybe the perfect scripture for this season of the church in quarantine in the entire Bible. Psalm 149 says this, let the faithful exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their couches. Yes, that's right, on their couches. So we have no excuse this morning, wherever we're watching from, even if it's from a couch, scripture invites us to sing for joy to our great God. So I invite you to do that with me right now, wherever you're at, as we worship together. This is Great Things. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet, for He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive, you break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken to life. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh, God, you have done great things. Yes, you have. Let's see His faithfulness together. Because you've been faithful through every storm. You've been faithful forever, Lord, and you have done great things. And I know you will do it again, for your promises, yes and amen. You will do great things. Oh God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive, you break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken to life. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Let's sing this together, hallelujah. And hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you 
I've done great things. Yes, she has. Lift that to him. Hallelujah. And hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Yes, you have. One more time together. Hallelujah. And hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God. Unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave, you free every captive, you break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things. Yes, you do. God, you're worthy of our praise. Always faithful. Yes, you are. You're mighty. You're powerful. Sing to you this morning. Amen. This is the God we serve who comes to the broken, to sinners, shows us who we can be in Him, who we were meant to be. He's worth this song. He's worth this time together. He's worth everything we have. So as we worship today, I invite you to lay aside every hindrance, every barrier between your heart and the God who came for it. Jesus, I finally see the cross, the nails you went through hell just to get to me. And oh Lord, King of kings to think you wore a crown of thorns just to get to me let's sing this together and I leave it all at the cross and I leave it all at the cross and here I will lay my guilt and shame I leave it all at the cross sing Jesus Jesus I finally see you tasted death with no regrets just to get to me speechless at your feet the heaven came and crossed the grave just to get to me and I leave it all at the cross and I leave it all at the cross and here I will lay my guilt and shame I leave it all at the cross yeah and I leave it all at the cross and I leave it all at the cross and here I will lay my guilt and shame I leave it all 
at the cross I bring it all before you all before you all before you Lord I bring it all before you all before you all before you Lord I bring it all before you all before you all before you Lord I bring it all before you all before you all before you Lord yeah, yeah. and I leave it all at the cross and I leave it all at the cross yeah here I will lay my guilt and shame I leave it at the cross, yes, I leave it all. At the cross, yeah, I leave it all. At the cross, God, here I will lay my guilt and shame. I leave it all at the cross. I leave it all at the cross And I leave it all at the cross And here I will lay my guilt and shame I leave it all at the cross God, we leave it all right here our shame, our sin, everything you came to free us from. Jesus, right here, we lay it down, right where we're at, wherever that might be, God. Those separated physically, God, we are united in this, that we are a community where each of us was once trapped in sin, but now have a home in you, with you, we have a family. We have a purpose. Today, God, give us the faith to embrace that new life. The life purchased on the cross for us. Guaranteed by the empty tomb. Let us walk in that, God. Every faithful step in line with our Savior. We know you've called us to greater. You've called us to more. God, we leave everything else behind and we embrace who you are. What you have for us. The life we couldn't earn on our own. The life of Christ, of resurrection, of hope, of newness, of faith. God, it's in the name of this Jesus who sets us free that we say together, amen. Amen. Well, thank you for worshiping with us this morning. We're going to continue to worship as we open the word with Pastor Donnie. A couple of years ago, Shannon and I had the opportunity to celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary by taking a cruise on the Adriatic Sea. It was amazing. We had so much fun together, by far the best trip that we've ever taken. It was a 14 day cruise and it stopped at some of the most beautiful places in Europe. And as we were boarding our ship in Barcelona, I, I immediately noticed a few things about this boat. One, it was huge, it, it was so big, and two, it was beautiful. It had been completely refurbished and, and everything was brand new and, and we were getting to take the maiden voyage. We were able to board early in the day and so we got to explore a little bit, we looked around and, and then we finally got settled into our cabin. And then we heard the captain's voice come over the loudspeaker calling us all to an assembly. To, to assemble, to go over the, the safety protocols, the, the what ifs, the, the just in case. Now, nobody really wants to, to get on a ship and begin to think about what might happen, all of the things that could go wrong. 
but it's an important procedure. And I'm a rule follower, so, so I signed up for it. I was ready to go. I didn't have a problem with it at all. But apparently, one guy did. On our way down to, to the assembly location, we, we heard several people just talking, and, and this one guy was just complaining how much of a waste of a time it was, how he knew everything that needed to happen. He'd been on ships before, and, and he knew what was going to take place, that, that he probably knew more than the crew. And then he said, after all the money that they spent refurbishing this ship, the chances of it sinking are virtually zero. I have to admit that when I heard him say that, I got a little nervous because all I could think about was the Titanic. And the last thing that you should be thinking about when you're getting ready to set sail on a cruise ship is the Titanic. The Titanic was the biggest, the fastest, the, the, the strongest, the most luxurious cruise ship of its time. It was the largest man-made object ever put in the water during this day. It took 12,000 men two years to build. And, it, and its crew was so confident that this ship was not only magnificent, but invincible. On Sunday morning, April 14th, 1912, when typically they would have had the drill to go over the lifeboat because they were entering some rough waters, Instead, they decided to forego this lifeboat drill because after all, what's the worst that could happen? And they were so confident that they even said, even God himself could not sink this ship. That night at around 11.40 p.m., the Titanic struck an iceberg. And thanks to Leonardo DiCaprio and Celine Dion, we know how this story ends. Our hearts still go on, even though Jack's didn't. It's hard to fathom that kind of arrogance and pride. That someone would have the audacity to say, even God himself could not sink this ship. I mean, can you imagine the pride that it would take to say something like that? I would never say something like that. I, I would never say that. I, I, I would never have that much pride. I would never. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear it. Pride is something that all of us struggle with. We may never say something like that, but yeah, we're going to deal with pride. Pride is a sin as, as old as the universe itself. Pride is what forced Lucifer from heaven. Pride is what put Adam and Eve out of the garden. Pride ruins everything it touches. And there's something about pride that, that just never ends well. And you may be listening and you think, no, not me. I, I don't struggle with that at all. And I'm afraid you may just be close to hitting that iceberg. Solomon says this in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. D.L. Moody, he said it this way, be humble or you'll stumble. Be humble or you'll stumble. Welcome to part six of exile. If you have your Bible or want to pull one up on your phone, we're going to be in the New Testament book of 1 Peter. Over the last few weeks, we've taken some time to work our way through this letter that was written by one of the original disciples of Jesus, a man by the name of, you guessed it, Peter. And if you know much about his story, you know that Peter was someone who struggled with pride. In fact, out of all of the disciples, Peter seemed to be the one who was always sticking his foot in his mouth. Several different times in the Gospels, we read that where it said that Peter answered and said, but then if you go back and look at the, the verses before that, you find nobody even asked a question. He, he was always just letting his pride get in his way. It was Peter who told Jesus that, that if everyone else leaves you, Lord, not me, I'm going to be here. I'll never leave you. I'll be here till the end. But we know that when the end came, not only was Peter not there, he even denied Jesus. From his very first encounter with Jesus, to his last, Peter struggled with pride. But the Peter that's writing to these exiles, the Peter that's writing this letter, 
It's not the same Peter who, who answered questions that no one ever asked. He had grown. He, he had matured. He had become wiser. He had experienced much of life the hard way and had the scars to prove it. And now he has valuable insight to share when it comes to dealing with this issue of pride. But before he gets to that, he gives a word to the leaders of the church, which is really not unrelated to what he has to say about pride. Look at what he says in verse number one of 1 Peter chapter five. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those who he has entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Last week, Ryan taught about suffering and what that looks like in the life of the believer and what our response to it should be. Suffering is one of the main themes of this letter, along with holiness and submission. 21 different times, Peter addresses the issue of suffering. And when suffering is present, good leadership must also be present, especially for those who feed the flock. Skip Heitzig says that those who feed God's suffering sheep will calm God's suffering sheep and help them make it through their suffering. And in a season like we're in now, the steady and capable hands of good leaders is imperative. As things get harder, leadership must get better. And so P Peter reminds those of us who are called to lead and to shepherd his flock to do so willingly to do so lovingly, not, not grudgingly, not out of compulsion, and, and to lead by example. The church needs godly leaders all of the time, but especially during hard times. But in the second half of verse five, Peter begins to shift the focus to something that affects us all, the sin of pride. C.S. Lewis said that pride is the cup from which all other sin is poured. In other words, those things that you and I struggle with the most, more often than not, we can trace them back to our pride. And look at what Peter writes in the second half of verse number five. He said, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Most of us get dressed every day. Now, now I get it. With COVID, that's a 50-50 that's a proposition these days. I mean, you got your morning pajamas and you transition into your evening pajamas. But for the most part, we get dressed every day. There is an intentionality to it. We choose the clothes that we're going to wear. Maybe some of you choose the morning of. Others may choose the night before. There may be one or two of you that your mom still lays out your clothes for you, Ryan. Uh, but, but we wouldn't imagine leaving our house without our clothes on. And Peter is saying the same thing here. He's saying that in your relations with others, intentionally clothe yourself with humility. It doesn't just happen. It takes work. It takes intentionality. You have to be purposeful about it. And he didn't put qualifiers on it. He didn't say, be humble with those who look like you, or who vote like you, who, or who act like you, or believe like you, or, or, or worship like you. He said, clothe yourself with humility when you deal with others, all others. The language that Peter is using here when he says clothe yourself is the language of a servant. Specifically, a servant who takes an apron or a towel, wraps it around his waist, and just quietly begins to serve. It was one of those lessons that, that Peter had to learn the hard way. It was a pride lesson. John 13, beginning in verse three, says this. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And so he, Jesus, got up from the mill, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. 
After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. And Peter said, no, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. This was one of those moments where Peter's pride got in the way. He entered the upper room with Jesus and the other guys, but he didn't think about washing feet. He didn't think about washing Jesus' feet. He certainly didn't think about washing the other guy's feet. He was thinking, that's somebody else's job. Don't we have somebody for that? Somebody else should do that. He was thinking about himself. A few years ago, Kevin and I had the opportunity to sit down with a former executive from Chick-fil-A. And as we were sitting around this table, this guy began to tell us the story of when the Chick-fil-A founder, Truett Cathy, was invited to a local university. This university was, was trying to get a grant from Chick-fil-A, and so they invited Mr. Cathy. And Mr. Cathy and the university president were walking around the campus, taking a tour of the grounds. When Mr. Cathy bent down to pick up some trash, and put it in the trash can. But, but as he did, the university president reached out and grabbed his arm and said, Mr. Kathy, you don't need to do that. We have people that will do that for you. <laughs> Guess who didn't get the grant? Jesus, in this moment, in just literally the hours before he would die on the cross, he didn't say, we have people for that. No, he modeled what it looks like to clothe yourself in humility, intentionally putting on clothes of a servant. And by the way, the truest test of whether you are a servant or not is how you respond when you're treated like one. You see, humility, humility is not frustrated when it doesn't get recognized. Humility celebrates when, when others get the credit. Humility, humility doesn't pause for praise, humility expects nothing in return. Humility walks in the room and says, there you are, not here I am. And Peter, at that moment in the upper room, he didn't understand it then, but now he gets it. And as he writes to these exiled believers, he says, clothe yourself in humility. But he doesn't stop there. Look at the rest of verse number five. Clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Why? Because God opposes the proud, but shows favor or gives grace to the humble. Peter's actually quoting from the Old Testament, the Old Testament book of Proverbs, chapter three, verse 34. James also quotes the same verse in James 4, 6. And just as a side note, I find it very interesting that the three different sermon studies that we've gone through this year as a church this year, 2020, all three have something to say about pride. Maybe it's something we should pay attention to. Maybe, just maybe, it's something that we need to address in our lives. Because the truth is, all of us live on the spectrum between pride and humility. All of us have a bent toward pride because pride is natural. Humility, that's supernatural. And humility is essential to having a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you think about it, that's where our relationship, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's where it begins. It starts when we humble ourselves and we admit that, that we're a sinner in need of a savior. But humbling ourselves before God shouldn't end when our relationship with him starts. Peter says that we have to intentionally put on the clothes of humility every day. God opposes pride actively, and he hates it passionately. Pride makes everything about us, about what we want, what we like, what we think will be best. Humility makes it all about Jesus. Pride puts me in control. Humility submits control. Pride criticizes. 
Humility compliments. Pride promotes self. Humility values others. Pride leads to isolation. Humility leads to community. Pride is a destination. Humility is a direction. Pride is how we war against God. Humility is how we worship God. Pride, in its essence, bows up. Humility, it bends low. This past week, Shannon and I, we sold our home that we've lived in for the last nine years. God has blessed us with an incredible opportunity to build a new home, but, but it's not quite ready just yet. And so we sold our home and we sold it a little faster than we anticipated, and so we had to move out. Fortunately, we have some incredible friends, some truly humble servants who, who loved us so well by helping us pack up and move out. If you've been to our home before, you know that, that Shannon had turned our backyard into kind of this oasis. She, she had plants and, and pathways and sitting areas and all of these different things. It really was quite beautiful. One of the things that she planted probably, I don't know, seven or eight years ago was a lemon tree. But I have to tell you that this lemon tree has been a huge disappointment for me because in the last seven or eight years, it's only produced fruit twice, and even then, not very much. <laughs> but as Murphy's Law would have it, now that we've sold this house, now that we've left this tree for someone else, this tree is filled with lemons, 200, maybe 300 lemons on this tree. A few weeks ago, I went outside and, and I noticed this, this huge branch on this lemon tree was bent down toward the ground. I thought it had actually broken off, but it wasn't broken. It was just heavy. It was heavy with fruit and it couldn't stand up straight anymore. So I had to prop a two by four under it to help it support its weight. I think this is what Peter had in mind. I think this is what he's getting at here when he talks about humility. The branch that bears the most fruit is the one that's bent lowest to the ground. Pride bows up, but humility, it bends low. Look at what Peter says in verse number six. Verse five says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Some of you, you've been waiting for due time for a long time. You've been waiting for a while now, wondering, when is it going to come? When is it going to be my time? When is it going to be the right time? When will God lift me up? And the truth is, I don't know. But what I do know is this, there's no substitute for humbling yourself. There's no substitute for humbling yourself. Peter says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand. Don't, don't skip over that because that's not how we think of humility. We think of being humbled as something that happens to us. It's not something that we, we do. We're kind of passive in it. If you've lived long enough, you, you understand the importance and, and the value of sometimes being humbled. We could all stand to be taken down a, a peg or two every once in a while. But Peter doesn't say that. He says, humble yourself. You see, we're not passive, we're active in this process. The place that we are all heading is lower, but the means for which we get there is dependent on our posture. We either kneel down or we fall down. Be humble or you'll stumble. No one sets a better example for us in this than does Jesus. In Philippians chapter two, Paul writes these words. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset or, or the same attitude as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, 
he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. He made himself nothing. He humbled himself. And so I'm not asking you to be humbled. What I'm saying is, and I'm trying to encourage you to humble yourself. Verse 9 says this, Therefore, or in other words, because Jesus humbled himself, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him that name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledged that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself and God exalted him. And this is our example. This is the example that we are to follow because there's no substitute for humbling yourself before God. When we humble ourselves at just the right time, he will lift us up. Jesus was exalted because he put on the clothes of humility. And one day, every knee will bow before him. So we can either humble ourselves or we can be humble. Either way, we end up taking a knee. Let's pray. Jesus, it's just impossible for us to understand how and to what extent you did this. That, that you would come here to earth and humble yourself. Make yourself nothing. God, we know how hard it is for us to do that. To humble ourselves in our marriages, in our friendships, and in families, and in the workplace. It's hard for us to treat other people better than ourselves. It's hard to humble ourselves, but, but you're God and you did this. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And, and you came here and you washed feet. You could have just stayed on your throne, but instead you chose a cross. So I ask today, God, would you help us? As hard as it is, would, would you help us to not wait to be humbled, but, but would you help us to humble ourselves, even in this moment? We acknowledge, God, that we don't have it all together. We're a mess. We need help. So God, I would ask that you would make room in our lives for your power to be demonstrated and help us humble ourselves so that at just the right time, you would lift us up. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray all of these things. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. I mentioned earlier in my message that when we become a follower of Jesus, it requires us to humble ourselves, to see our need for a savior. I realize though that I may be talking to somebody today who's never done that. You've been spending your life trying to figure out things on your own, trying to do it on your own. And as someone who was there, someone who's done that in my own life, I gotta tell you, it's pretty exhausting. I would encourage you to make today the day that you exchange your life for the life of Jesus Christ, that you humble yourself, see your need for a Savior, because it's worth it. We would love to have this conversation with you, even walk this journey with you. The best way to let us know is to text the word prayer to 210-585-4006, and we'll get in touch with you this week. If you'd like to dive deeper into today's message, I would encourage you to join us this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for our CG Collective. You can look for the Zoom link this week in your email inbox. Now, stick around for some closing thoughts from our Young Adults Director, Hannah Atkinson. Guys, thank you so much for joining us in a time of worship today. 
We know that everybody is kind of adjusting to a new normal right now. Some of you are having to figure out fourth grade math all over again. Some of you are figuring out fourth grade math for the very first time. And that is great. Either way, you're keeping your first graders on Zoom calls and you're keeping your high schoolers off TikTok during their Zoom calls. You're juggling a lot right now, but we're excited to be able to announce a couple things that we think might brighten your week as we head into this fall semester. Next week, we have a week packed full of events planned for you. Starting on September 13th, which is actually ACC's 10th birthday. That's right, we are going to be fifth graders in the proverbial school world, and we are so excited to get to celebrate with you. One of the ways we wanna do that is through a video or a montage of all of our collective favorite moments from the last 10 years. So what we would like for you to do is to search through your Facebook, go to an album five years back, find a memory that you really loved from ACC, or maybe even just grab your phone, hold it like this, this is important, and film yourself just like this, saying something for about 30 seconds about your favorite memory, something that you loved or thought was funny from your time here at ACC. We're so excited to hear about your memories, to hear from everybody else, and to celebrate the work that God has been doing over the last decade in the life of our church. And that, my friends, starts fall launch 2020. Between the 13th all the way through the end of that week, we're going to have different ministries starting up again. So if you have a middle schooler or a high schooler, you can email Daniel at alamocommunity.org. He would love to get your middle schoolers invested on Sundays, high schoolers on Wednesdays, building community and hanging out together. If you are a young adult, you can email me at hannah at alamocommunity.org. We start up September 15th. We're going to be doing groups in homes all over San Antonio, and we're so excited to get people connected. If you know a young adult that needs Jesus and needs some friends, send them my way. And lastly, for all of our other adults, we are going to be starting CGs on September 16th. Those are going to start online, and then they're going to move to an in-person setting at our new building once it opens. So we're really excited for that. If you would like more information on that, you can email izzy at alamocommunity.org. And as always, none of this would be possible without your faithful giving to our local church body. So just as a reminder, if you're looking to give today, we've got the big three available. First, through a push pay app, second, through the ACC app, and then third, through the mailing address listed below. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. We love you like crazy. We can't wait to see you, and we hope you have an amazing week.